So let me take this opportunity now to officially uh, welcome you to today's presentation uh, on employee accommodations under the ADA. And this today's session will be with a special focus on the deaf, the hard of hearing, and the blind communities. So our primary audience today uh, are HR specialists and in-house counsel attorneys involved to some degree in employment matters at their firms. So many of you are from among our current clients all over the United States. As we established a few minutes ago, uh, it looks like the great majority is, is uh, actually from the East Coast. Uh, but, you know, uh, we got Montana and a couple of other interesting places. So uh, welcome to you all, uh, to our newcomers and to our uh, clientele. It's, it's, it's great to have you. My name is Adam Karish. I am the Chief Executive Officer at, at Karish. Uh, our firm has its headquarters in the Philadelphia area in Westchester. Uh, we conduct hundreds of remote accessibility service sessions every week. Uh, we have been serving the community for 40 years and uh, with clients in all 50 states uh, in varying industries and 24-7 in-house tech support. We, we like to consider our team uh, being made up really of experts in the accessibility services and remote solutions uh, domain. Uh, especially for ADA accommodations, and in particular for the deaf, the hard of hearing, and the visually impaired. I am joined today by Michael Torsha, Esquire, an experienced employment attorney and presenter. Uh, Michael, why don't, you, why don't you say hello? Thank you, Adam. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Torsha. I'm one of the managing members of Seminoff, Ormsby, Greenberg, and Torsha. We're here in a suburb of uh, Philadelphia. I've been a labor and employment attorney for 30 years or so, and uh, happy to speak to you today about ADA and employee issues, something that we talk about very frequently. Uh, I will take this opportunity for those Pennsylvania attorneys out there. Mm -hmm. This program has been approved for one substantive CLE credit. Um, if you'd like to get that substantive CLE credit and you are a Pennsylvania attorney, at the end of this presentation in the chat box, I will put in a verification code and an email address where if you just send your name, your bar ID number, the verification code uh, to the email address, we will take care of the rest. So there's no extra charge for, no charge at all for the uh, CLE credit. Okay. So thank you, Mike. Um, we will we'll talk briefly um, about today's presentation. I'll give you a little overview of what you can expect. So with Mike's help, we'll be highlighting legal liabilities using legal case studies resulting from the ADA law in employment specifically, as I said, with a focus on the deaf, the hard of hearing, and the blind communities in particular. But we'll also be balancing out that, balancing that out with a um, by presenting how to navigate avoiding these potential legal liabilities with very practical solutions. And as some of you might know, uh, this event is part of a series uh, called ADA Compliance in Practice, and the series focuses on the relevance of ADA law for the deaf, the hard of hearing, and the visually impaired. <clears throat> and each session showcases uh, legal and practical implications and solutions uh, for individual ADA law titles. Today's, of course, we'll be covering Title I in particular. Uh, we did a similar webinar yesterday uh, focused on Title III, uh, and we'll be doing uh, the, same, uh, the same webinars uh, in the upcoming month. And so if you missed uh, the one on education and you'd like to see it, please uh, reach out to us and we'll send you a link and you can get registered. We will end the presentation today with a, a brief uh, Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask them. Uh, just put them in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to them either during the presentation or directly after in the Q&A session. And you, as you might have noticed, your mics have been muted to avoid any distraction uh, of other attendees. But your chat box function will be on all the time. So. Mike, why don't I hand it over to you at this point? Great. Thanks, Adam. So we're going to start today with sort of a legal overview of the ADA. Some of you may know some of this already. Um, if you are struggling with trying to figure out some of the regulations 
of the ADA, um, that is not surprising because the ADA is fairly complicated. We like to put it in simple terms, but it really isn't simple. So starting off with you know, the real basics here, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, is a federal law, not state, that was passed in 1990. And other than developing through case law, wasn't really changed significantly until 2008. And in 2008, there was an amendment to the ADA. Some people call it the ADA AA, which is a little strange to say. Um, but the significance of the amendment was that it expanded the scope of the definition of a disability. So it made it clear that a disability included many more conditions than what was previously thought and what uh, courts had previously interpreted it to be. So the ADA itself is, consists of variety of titles, um, five titles primarily, but we're going to be talking about today, as Adam said, Title I, which is particularly employment provisions. So that's distinguished from, as we said, Title III in our seminar yesterday was public accommodations, those things that apply to the public in general. Today applies to the employment relationship, employer-employer uh, relationship. The first thing you need to know is that the ADA does not apply to all employers. So it only applies to employers with 15 or more employees. So if you are an employer or you represent an employer with 12 employees, as an example, the ADA does not apply to you. Now that can be a little bit deceiving because many states have laws prohibiting disability discrimination. And it's very common for those state laws to apply even if a business entity has less than 15. So it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the business is free to discriminate against disabled individuals, but it does mean that the specific provisions of the ADA uh, don't apply to businesses with less than 15. The way you count those employees is in the second paragraph here. And as Adam said, this presentation is being recorded. So we don't want you to feel like you have to take notes on every one of these slides. And some of these slides are going to be uh, pretty involved with some of the text. But this is how you count 15 employees. And the point of it is, it is not a hair trigger requirement. So in other words, if you have 14 employees today and you hire one employee Tomorrow, that doesn't mean you're automatically subject to the ADA. A, a period of time has to go by, usually 20, 20 weeks. Um, basically, the employment provisions of the ADA prohibit employers from discriminating against, and you'll see here, this is a bolded section, a qualified individual with a disability. And you can't discriminate against an individual with a disability with respect to any portion of the employment relationship. So you can't discriminate when it comes to hiring or firing or any other employment decisions. And that would include employee leave or promotions or whatever that, that may be. Um, I'm sure you've heard before that an employer is required to make a reasonable accommodation to an employee's disability. Now, that's not absolute. An employer doesn't have to provide a reasonable accommodation no matter what. There are a couple of exceptions to that. And in this COVID environment, this is really becoming a popular topic of when an employer does not have to provide a reasonable accommodation. So the two big categories are, an employer does not have to provide a reasonable accommodation if there is a quote unquote undue hardship. And they also don't have to provide an accommodation if it would pose a quote unquote direct threat to the health and safety of that employee or others in the workplace. So that kind of makes sense, right? You have to provide an accommodation to an employee, but not if, if it's going to pose a safety threat and not 
if it is going to be a real hardship on the business to do so. Um, we're going to get back to undue hardship, but it's not as easy as you might think to meet that standard of undue hardship. So when I said a minute ago, if you're having trouble kind of working your way through the ADA, it's not surprising. This is one of the reasons why, you know, this is peeling back the layers of the onion of this statute saying, all right, you can't discriminate against someone, a qualified individual with a disability. Well, what does that mean? Okay. A qualified individual with a disability is this definition. It's someone who can perform the essential functions of the job, whatever those might be, with or without a reasonable accommodation. As you can probably guess, essential functions is, is further defined. Um, disability, of course, is defined under the ADA. So what is a disability under the ADA? Well, a disability means, and you see these three bullet points at the bottom, it means that someone has a physical or mental impairment. But that's not all that means, right? Once again, let's do another layer. It, it means a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. And for those of you who might look at case law interpreting ADA, you will know that there are hundreds of cases literally on almost every word in these definitions. There are cases about what is an impairment? What does substantially limiting mean? What is a major life activity? Um, so disability is someone who has those issues and also has a record of such impairment. In other words, a history of that impairment or, and I find this very interesting, this line of cases is very interesting, people who are regarded as having an impairment, or sometimes you see it listed as they're perceived as having an impairment. So what does that mean? That means pretty much what it sounds like. The employer assumes or believes that the employee has a disability, but they really don't. But that person's still protected. So for example, if an employer says to an employee, you know, I think, I, I know you have cancer and I don't want my health insurance premiums to increase, so I'm going to have to let you go. And the employer fires that employee and the employee says, I don't have cancer. I don't know where you got that idea. That employee has a claim under the ADA, even though that employee doesn't actually have a disability because they are regarded as or perceived as having a disability. All right. So what's a major life activity? All right, here we go. And I will just tell you, I don't need to read every one of these bullet points. Major life activity is almost anything that people do. And you can see how broad these categories are. Walking, thinking, <laughs> you know, thinking. Do, do we have to go any further than thinking? But okay, thinking, uh, standing, working, reading, sleeping, caring for oneself, eating, et cetera. So these are all major life activities. So if someone has an impairment that affects a major life activity, it's covered. Major life activities also were expanded in that amendment that we talked about to include major bodily functions. And once again, no need to talk about these in detail. I will tell you that this is meant to cover pretty much every major bodily function that a person might have. So functions of the immune system, of the respiratory system, brain functions, digestive functions, whatever that may be. Um, so you can see that many, many health conditions and many, many injuries will be covered under the definition of disability. Now, what's not covered are injuries or conditions that are temporary. Breaking your leg is not a disability under the ADA. Uh, something that will heal you know, relatively quickly is not a disability under the ADA. Okay, one of the things that the uh, ADA amendment made very clear, and it was not clear, is that when you're thinking about or trying to figure out whether someone has a disability, an employee, you need to ignore the mitigating measures. So mitigating obviously are measures that reduce the effect, 
but you have to ignore that. What that means, let's say a, one of your employees um, has a disability with their leg. They, they cannot walk uh, normally. That would be considered a disability. But let's say they use a walker or let's say they use maybe arm braces. And through the use of those arm braces, they can walk and be, you know, just as mobile as anyone else. And the employer may say, well, Sally, yeah, um, this is my fictional employee, Sally. Sally may have a disability, but she really doesn't because she uses arm braces and she fixed it. That's really what we're saying, right? It's, it's, it's fixed. No, you cannot do that under the ADA. You have to ignore the arm braces and say, does Sally have a disability, you know, aside from any mitigating measures that she may be using? And for this session we're doing today, and Adam's going to talk about it in a, in a little bit, um, you, you'll see the third and fourth bullet points here. What about assistive technology and reasonable accommodations and auxiliary services for people who are deaf, hard of hearing, or visually impaired? You need to ignore those things and then decide whether someone has a disability. It does not count eyeglasses, though, <laughs> or contact lenses. Um, I think Congress said, and I, I, I would agree with this, you can't count eyeglasses or contact lenses. That would be everyone, you know, or most people, you know, too many people with disabilities. So that's not a disability if you cannot, if you need eyeglasses to, uh, to see. All right. You've heard the term reasonable accommodations before. Providing a reasonable accommodation can be any change in the way someone works um, to allow them to do the job, to perform the essential functions. We get the question all the time, well, what are the essential functions of the job? The answer is, you answer that. You, the employer, you answer what the essential functions are. Are the essential functions to be able to sit in a chair for eight hours and to read a computer screen or to lift 50 pounds or to drive a forklift, or whatever it may be. Um, you decide what the essential functions are, and it would be very helpful if those essential functions were in a job description somewhere. And that way, when you are asking a doctor, you know, is this person disabled, you can give them the job description and say, well, these are the essential functions. Can this employee perform the essential functions? And then and that way the doctor um, can, can give an opinion about that. But, but an accommodation can be really many, many things that you change or provide to the employee. So some examples, a leave of absence beyond the amount of leave granted by the employee's policies, employer's policies. If your policy says you get two weeks off and the employee, the disabled employee says, I need another week, that might be a reasonable accommodation. In fact, probably would be. Working from home. This is a hot topic, right? A year ago, I don't know about you, but we went, we started working remotely in mid-March, so we're not quite there yet. A year ago, uh, people debated, employers debated whether it was reasonable for someone to work from home. Are they really set up to work from home? How do you monitor that? Uh, are they really getting work done, et cetera, et cetera? Well, it's going to be a lot harder to argue now that it's not reasonable for someone to work from home when many businesses have gone remote and people have been working from home for a year. So that, that one is, um, is, is interesting how that's evolved. Modifying a work schedule, providing devices. You may have to provide a device to a disabled uh, employee. I mean, that could be a keyboard, it could be a chair, it might be, you know, a desk that moves up and down, it could be, you know, some, something um, th that, is, um, uh, that is attached to uh, a phone or a screen, it could be, you know, uh, closed captioning, and again, Adam will talk about the choices and some of, those, uh, some of those options. It could be modifying space. Uh, most businesses should have this anyway, like, you know, handicapped bathrooms and ramps and, and those sorts of things, but some do not. 
Uh, it may have to be that you need to provide it for a, for a particular employee. Um, I told you we talk about undue hardship. I, I, I will talk about that just for a minute. Um, so many employers love to say or, or, or hope or wish to say, we can't provide this accommodation. It is an undue hardship on our business to do it. It's just, it's gonna wreck our business. In determining whether there would be an undue hardship, a judge or a jury, if it ever got that far, sometimes it's the government who, who they do investigations and they come in, they will look at the overall size of the employer, the number of employees, the types of facilities it has, and the size of the budget that you have for your business. It'll look at the accommodation versus the effect on the business when it comes to expenses and resources and the impact it would have on the business. And then it's kind of common sense, they would look at other factors as well, such as what's the type of operation? Is it an office setting? Is it a manufacturing setting? Are the employees working construction or something? Um, what's the makeup of the workforce? How are they paid? How much does the accommodation cost? Is there a direct threat? Is there a safety threat? Um, so a good example, if there's a manufacturing operation and someone says, um, I need an accommodation where uh, I need to you know, sit closer to the machine because I can't stand. I need to sit and I need to sit closer to the machine. And the employer says, that's not safe. You know, the, the machine um, criteria, safety measures are you need to be two feet away. That's not safe. You don't need to provide that accommodation because there's a safety threat to the employee and, and, and maybe others. Um, but what if the employee, the employee says, I need to sit closer to the machine and it's not a safety threat. And the employer says, look, if I get you a chair, I'm gonna to have to get everybody a chair. And the chair is $400 each. And if you multiply that times how many employees we have, that's an undue hardship. I will tell you that that's not an undue hardship under the regulations and the cases that we've seen. Providing things like that in the hundreds of dollars, maybe even the thousands of dollars, is generally not an undue hardship. If you're, if you're talking about you know, money or I hate to say this because most of our clients are businesses. We represent businesses. If it's just money, uh, courts will um, be very hesitant to decide it's an undue hardship. It has to be something that would change the, the, the nature of your business or, or would cost so much that it would affect the health, the financial health of the company. That's, that's extraordinary. That's very difficult to meet that standard. So the, so the message there is, don't be so quick to say and deny uh, an accommodation because of an undue hardship. And that last bullet point there is very, very commonly stated by the employer. They say, if we change the work schedule for Sally because of her disability, that means that the other three people in the group may have to work harder or may have to take some of her responsibilities. That's not fair to those employees. That's not a factor. The fairness to the other employees is really not a factor unless it's gonna change the nature of your business. That happens very often where a disabled individual, disabled employee um, has an effect on others in the department. And, and unfortunately, that's just not a major factor. Okay, two more before I turn it over to Adam. Um, so through all of these definitions, through all of these definitions, and all of these layers of what you have to look at uh, to decide whether someone's disabled and major life activities and undue hardship, really boiling it down, you, you really have to remember only two things. Let's keep it simple for the employer. And those two things are, number one, the employer must engage in the interactive process. The interactive process means the employee comes to you and says, I can't do my job properly or efficiently because I have a disability or I have a health condition and I need the following in order to do that. The employer must talk about it. 
You must have the conversation. You may not, employer, say, you know what, too bad. I know you're asking for a, an expensive chair. No, we're not going to do that. That's not, in, that's not interactive. That's not engaging in the conversation. So the first responsibility is to engage in the conversation. The second responsibility is the employer, as we said a minute ago, must actually provide the accommodation unless it's an undue hardship or safety threat. So number one, you need to talk about it. Number two, you need to provide it. I'm not going to get too far into the weeds right now of, um, of one concept, which is the employer does not have to provide the accommodation that the employee requests necessarily. The employee might say, um, I need a sign language interpreter to stand next to me all day. And the employer might say, well, no, we can get you closed captioning or something else. So, and then you have that conversation. So the employer is not bound to do whatever the employee says, but you need to engage in that interactive process. We've had many cases where the employer was correct because the accommodation being requested was unreasonable, but they didn't talk about it. They didn't engage in the interactive process and therefore they still had liability under the ADA. All right, and then finally, very common question we get asked, is, well, so what? What if we do it wrong? <laughs> what are the penalties? Um, yeah, you, don't want, you don't want to get into the penalties. The penalties are not good. If someone is terminated because of their disability, if you discriminate against them or they're, they are forced to quit and they file a lawsuit or a claim with the EEOC, um, they can get a variety of damages. They can get back pay, which is the amount they would have earned from today going back to the time that they were terminated. They can get front pay, which is compensation from today going forward into the future for a time when they would have probably left your company. You know, who knows when that is? Was, is that a year from now? Is that five years from now? They can get emotional distress damages in some circumstances punitive damages can be awarded. And those damages are punishment against companies that did it intentionally or should have known better. And then you have to pay the employee's attorney's fees. If you get sued, you're paying you know, their attorney's fees. Plus, you're paying your own attorneys for defending you in the case. And ironically, put this at the end here, ironically, after all of the lawsuit uh, the litigation and the, and the money damages and the attorney's fees, you probably will end up having to provide the, the reasonable accommodation in the end anyway. So you really don't want to be in litigation if you can help it at all. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but you'd like to try to avoid it if possible. All right. So that's a lot of legalese, I know, but let's turn to the actual uh, description of some of these accommodations. I'll let uh, I'll let Adam take it from here before we do the case studies at the end. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, we also have a question here that's kind of relevant to what you were mentioning, but maybe we can take that in the Q and A section unless you feel you want to handle it now. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, AIDS. Uh, so but let, let me preface this whole section by emphasizing that that, that Title One accommodations. Uh, these requirements are equally as relevant to on-site recruitment and employment encounters as they are to online and remote encounters. So as we'll be discussing in the particular case studies coming up, an employer's responsibility includes, but is not limited to, the interview and evaluation process, as well as the internal meetings and encounters for the duration of employment. So what you have to remember is that upon a specific request by an individual who is unable to access specific content, your institution is obliged to provide accommodations for, and here are some examples, for any new video or audio content that's being produced or posted on official channels such as the company website or official Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, training videos, live events, uh, including content and events that are live streamed over the internet, like announcements or presentations or other events of high interest. 
in this COVID-19 reality, you have to keep in to uh, accommodations in mind as well for pre-recorded material. So all of these have to be, have to be considered. Regarding legacy content, which I just touched on, you, that you may not be bound to making legacy content fully accessible in your specific case, but it should also be kept in mind uh, as well uh, if you conduct, for example, an internal uh, you know, accessibility audit, for example. So now I might have raised some questions here and, and Mike as well, uh, but don't worry, we'll be digging into the details in these uh, two specific case studies coming up and the requirements uh, will become a little bit more clear to you. I'm going to walk through a couple of examples. So if you could move to the next slide. Right, so uh, I'm gonna be walking through a couple of examples of primary accommodations for the deaf, the hard of hearing, and the visually impaired. So like Mike uh, said, the ADA law stipulates a list of very specific auxiliary aids and services. These are otherwise referred to as accommodations. The federal regulation proposes a long list, right, of specific accommodations, but that list includes in some cases, you know, arcane and outdated recommendations such as you know, te telephone hand, uh, handset amplifiers or simply exchanging written notes. Uh, several though are really quite mainstream, they're popular, and they're used commonly at corporations, you know, for board meetings, training sessions, as well as uh, in the educational settings uh, that we work in throughout the United States and by US owned corporations that are active abroad. So what we decided to do here was to focus on outlining four of the most universal solutions that are most often provided on site as well as remotely. So let me emphasize that based on our experience with ADA compliance accommodations for businesses in all 50 states, all these examples are equally relevant solutions for on-site employment settings, as well as, as your remote settings. So what we're gonna be doing is walking through uh, four, what I'd call baskets. And uh, the, the first will be real-time captioning. The second will be transcription and note-taking for pre-recorded audio files. The third, uh, qualified interpreters, on-site or remote, and the fourth, dedicated services for the visually impaired. So real-time captioning, if you could move to the next slide. Great. So real-time captioning. Uh, real-time captioning is otherwise referred to as CART captioning. CART captioning is perhaps the most ubiquitous and inclusive accommodation for the deaf and the hard of hearing communities uh, during live events such as interviews, uh, team or uh, board meetings, presentations, etc. CART is an acronym and it stands for Communication Access Real-Time Translation. And it's the process of turning all the spoken word into captioned text. And CART is provided in real time for an individual or for a group in any setting. Now the speaker's audio is transmitted from a microphone to a certified captioner and it's displayed as text on a large screen, you know, a large video screen or, or on a monitor or a laptop computer. And that is typically with 97, 98% accuracy. And that all happens within two to four seconds. Within the real time captioning category, we also have internet captioning, and live stream for live streamed events and, um, you know, on the internet as well as uploaded videos that are streamed on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, and within this basket, we wanted to talk briefly about meaning for meaning captioning, which some of you might be familiar with. It is the real time conversion of speech into summarized text for individual viewers. So this service is most often provided for meetings like municipality meetings and appointments, as well as in an educational context like staff training or at uh, university classes, et cetera. You may have heard of TypeWell or CPrint, but those are just uh, software solutions and they're software used for meaning for meaning uh, service providing. So in terms of the end user's experience, uh, TypeWell and CPrint are identical to one another. In this basket is also broadcast captioning, which 
is very similar to the ones I mentioned above. It requires a, a specialized type of software and exceptional skill on behalf of the captioner. Uh, we most often use broadcast captioners for TV programs, uh, large, you know, large scale public events, or simply if a client specifically requests a broadcast captioner. So the second category that we'll be talking about is uh, just looking if the oh if we could move to the next slide is transfer thank you is uh, transcription note taking and offline captioning. So uh, transcription is the creation of a one hundred percent accurate verbatim transcript from a pre recorded audio or video file, whereas note taking is a little different. It's very popular in corporate settings. It's the process of taking verbatim or summarized notes from meetings and presenting them in some readable format. So like I said, either verbatim or summarized in some format. And when it comes to note taking, there are really myriad formats, levels of accuracy that different institutions require, turnaround times. Um, it's really dependent on the independent needs of, of who needs them. So then we have offline or closed captioning. It's basically closed captions are for pre-recorded material and that's used for broadcast or internet videos. The captions uh, for these can be turned off, hence the name uh, offline captions. On, uh, open captioning, uh, on the other hand, uh, is very similar to closed. The difference is, is that the captions cannot be turned off and they're often referred to as subtitles. The next, uh, the next, uh, during the next slide here, we'll be talking about qualified interpreters. That's for on-site or remote, as you see today. American Sign Language, for example, or ASL, can be provided on-site or remotely uh, in a business meeting, you know, a lecture hall, or at a live event. So, what I want to emphasize here is you only want to permit trained and certified. ASL interpreters to cover your meetings to ensure the best real-time services available, accuracy and timing, et cetera, the quality of, of the interpreting. Another service that you might not be familiar with is less common is tactile ASL, tactile signing. So this refers to signing using touch. It's a common means of communication used by people with deaf blindness and it is based on sign language or some other system of manual communication. So what I tried to highlight in these past three, especially in, in the third basket, was that you have to keep in mind that when you're selecting an accommodation, you have to be attentive to your candidates or your employees' specific needs. For example, some people are late deafened. They're not born deaf and they don't know ASL. So captioning for them would be a better option. Those fluent on the other hand in ASL, they take great pride in their unique language, in their culture, and they don't necessarily consider captions as a true alternative to ASL interpreting. So in some cases, as in the case of today's webinar, uh, both uh, is, is often the best option. So in this next slide uh, and this final one in terms of the baskets of uh, of solutions, uh, we'll be talking about dedicated services for the visually impaired. And I'm just gonna be talking about two, uh, two, two solutions for the visually impaired. Real-time Braille cart, what we call Braille cart is provided by a certified expert caption, uh, cart captioner who then connects to the blind individual's Braille reader. And this allows the end user to interact in real time really in any environment. It's worth noting that this is not exactly a fully remote service, but it is, it is possible. Audio description. Now, audio description is an inter interesting service for the visually impaired, which is the process of narrating the actions and the events that take place in a video or, or at a live event. Now, until COVID-19 restrictions hit, we provided this service for training seminars and plays in theatrical productions, et cetera, not even for concerts. But currently this is, this is primarily ordered for pre-recorded materials rather than for live events. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it back to, back to Mike to walk through the case studies.
All right. Um, so we have 71 case studies. No, I'm just teasing. We have two, we have two, we have two, two, two case studies um, that we want to talk about, which are somewhat, somewhat different uh, to illustrate some of these points. Um, the first one is Noel, Noel versus IBM. This was a federal lawsuit filed um, around uh, 2013, 2014, and the decision came out in 2015. But this is interesting because Noel was an employee of IBM, uh, a software engineer who was deaf, and he worked many years for the company. And he was provided by IBM with ASL interpreters whenever he wanted for meetings and for and video content as well as CART. But in this case, Mr. Knoll demanded that all of the intranet videos be captioned and all of the audio files have transcript, transcripts. So this was not resolved informally as many cases are, and it actually went to trial. And the trial court decided in favor of IBM and said, what IBM is providing is fine, but IBM did not have to uh, caption all of the back videos and training that they had. So Mr. Knoll appealed, and in federal court, you go from the trial court to the court of appeals. There's only one more step, which is the U.S. Supreme Court, but he went to the court of appeals, and the court of appeals affirmed the trial court, said that the trial court decision was correct, and decided that the ASL interpreters and the CART were reasonable accommodations, and IBM had been providing those and needed to continue to provide them. But requiring the company to caption all videos and provide transcripts to all audio files was unreasonable. So this is a good example of the fight was not over whether providing captioning or an interpreter was a reasonable accommodation, it was the scope of the accommodation and whether it posed an undue hardship. This was an in interesting case because looking at those factors we talked about, the size of the company, the operations of the company, the cost of the accommodations, the judge determined that even though IBM had 440,000 employees at the time, it's incredible, um, but yet still decided that the accommodation was an undue hardship for a company that size. And the reason was because there were 46,000 video files and 35,000 audio files. And the judge said or determined, you know, even though it was somewhat of an inconvenience for the plaintiff to use um, ASL, the employer was not required to provide the best accommodation and was not required to provide an accommodation that the employee requested necessarily. That's what we talked about earlier. You don't have to do what the employee says. They have to provide merely an effective accommodation. Now, I'll pause here for a minute. For, for those of you who may have uh, attended our seminar yesterday on public accommodations, one very important concept, though, even though you don't have to do what the employee says, is you do have to provide accommodations that are industry standard. So you do have to provide accommodations that are common in the industry. Uh, so you know many of the accommodations that uh, Adam was talking about are in fact industry standard, and and th that should be considered that you're using something that's up to date and what you know what's what's commonly considered to be effective. Um, so the Court of Appeals the, the, is, is a three-judge panel, and one judge dissented. One judge didn't agree. It was a two-to-one decision, and that judge said, you know what? This question of whether it's reasonable or not really should go to the jury. You know, we should let people decide, not the judges. The other two judges said, nah, we decide. We're not going to let it go to the jury. So, and that was the end of the case. So that Mr. Knoll continued to get certain accommodations, but he was not successful in getting the 46,000 video files and 35,000 files uh, uh, converted. You know what, actually, before we go on to the second one, I'll, 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 I'll give, you a, give you a bonus case study. Um, so there was a case that's pending right now called 
Kane. Kane versus Zoom video. Yeah, Zoom, like what we're on, you know, Zoom video. And it's an interesting case because it's a class action lawsuit and was filed in December, just this past December, um, in federal court in New York. It wasn't filed by employees, but it was filed by a class of disabled individuals who are alleging that uh, even though Zoom provides captioning to its service, they, they, they charge an extra fee. And the lawsuit is saying, no, you shouldn't be charging an extra fee. You know, you should be providing this at no charge. Um, we should be treated like everyone else and, and shouldn't have to, to have to pay for it. Um, it it's interesting because um, Adam and I were just talking before, <clears throat> before the seminar uh, this morning that Zoom put out an announcement that uh, in the fall, they expect to have the captioning available you know, for no, for no charge. I have to believe it has something to do with this pending lawsuit. But the tie-in between the public accommodations and the employee issues is that just that, you can't charge employees. And we have employers ask all the time, well, we can provide an accommodation, but why should we have to pay for it? You know, shouldn't they have to pay for it? And the answer is no. No, under the ADA, the employer <laughs> pays for the... Um, the accommodation. I might just add here with the bonus case that you talked about, Michael, is, uh, is that uh, as is often the case with things that are free, is we get back into the industry standard question. I have what's probably going to happen is there is there there's going to be an automated, you know, AI solution applied, which is going to produce what we often see with AI solutions is gibberish every other sentence or every 10 words or so, uh, proper names that are not written properly. Uh, when there are multiple speakers, uh, you know, AI just can't handle that and won't be able to handle that for years. So I think that this is not the end of the road on this issue. I think there, uh, there might be a solution, kind of a Google-esque type of, type of solution, but it's not at all going to be valuable for uh, or it won't be appropriate, an appropriate accommodation, I think, for people who, uh, especially for corporate clients, for education clients, I think it's going to be uh, substandard. But we'll see. We'll see. We, we, we will see, especially when there's a pending lawsuit. Yeah. Um, all right. So the, case, the second case study um, is different from the first one. The first one was Mr. Knoll suing IBM. He was a longtime employee of that company, uh, and he had been already given accommodations. This is a case where there were two deaf women who were not employees of the defendant of S&B industry. They were applicants. They were applying for jobs in the company's cell phone repair facility. So they went in with some others to interview for the job. And during a group interview, the two uh, applicants used ASL to communicate with one another. They then requested that the supervisor provide written information about the positions for which they were applying. So you can sort of imagine that there was a group of applicants, they're getting information from people who are speaking with them, including a supervisor, um, but the supervisor and the presentation really wasn't set up for uh, deaf applicants. So they asked for the information to be written. The supervisor initially complied and said, sure, and then refused to continue writing information. Again, sort of reading between the lines, you know, the supervisor probably said, okay, fine, and then got tired of doing it or thought it was too cumbersome and then stopped. Eventually, the applicants were rejected for employment. They did not get the job. Well, they filed a claim with the EEOC. And again, without getting off on a tangent about the procedures here, uh, applicants or employees must first file a claim with the federal agency. They can't go right to court. They have to file a claim first. Um, and then many times, uh, very often, those claims get resolved with the EEOC. There's also state agencies where people can file claims. So they filed the claim with the EEOC. The EEOC then agreed to represent them 
and filed a lawsuit in Texas federal court. This is why if you look at the case name, it doesn't have the name of the applicants. It has the EEOC. Um, most of the time, the EEOC does not agree to represent someone. You know, they will determine whether there's a case or not. But in cases where they feel is important or is egregious, uh, the EEOC has the right to take up that claim and sue the company itself. So that's how it gets to be the EEOC versus, in this case, uh, S and B. They file a federal lawsuit in Texas, and a settlement was negotiated. Again, very, very common for settlements to be negotiated rather than going to a trial with a jury. Uh, the latest statistics that I've heard are a couple of years old because they don't come out every year, but something like 93, 94% of employment cases that are filed end up resolving. Do not go to a trial. And in this COVID environment, when jury trials for civil cases are halted entirely, uh, the percentage of those cases that are settling is even higher because people know that they have to wait so long for a jury trial. But that's another issue. So the settlement under uh, the EEOC for these two applicants, there was a three-year consent decree. And a consent decree is just a fancy term for a settlement agreement. And the company agreed to do the following. They agreed to pay $110,000 in monetary relief. So who knows what that was for? Probably it was for back pay. You know, we talked about the damages going back uh, for a while, probably for back pay for the two for the two ladies. They agreed to post a public notice about the settlement. In other words, they had to come clean to the public and say, we settled this case. They agreed to provide training for their employees on the ADA, uh, which included reasonable accommodation processes. Again, the implication here is that the supervisor had not been properly trained and had rejected that accommodation without really asking anyone. Um, is it a reasonable accommodation to have a supervisor write instructions or to provide uh, a meeting for applicants you know, that is appropriate for uh, deaf individuals? Absolutely, absolutely. Company also agreed to send managers and HR professionals uh, to uh, training, to a separate third-party training, and they agreed to keep a written log of all the complaints of disability discrimination and report to the EEOC what was happening. So the EEOC said, we wanna know if there are any more, any more claims. The one thing that you don't see in this settlement is you don't see where the applicants got the job. You know, they weren't hired by the company ultimately. Um, that's also very typical, that usually by the time employees or applicants sue the company, the company doesn't want them and they don't want to go to the company. So there's a settlement, but they don't actually end up, uh, end up you know, with, with the job. Um, and did you want to comment on the settlement? I know you had some thoughts on uh, kind of the implications of this. Yeah, uh, very briefly. Um, I, I guess the, a after a few years of proceedings, each of these, you know, both of these lawsuits, they were both settled. So uh, what's important, I guess, is that these, these cases, they can't be treated as some type of a specific precedent for other cases uh, or for, for the, the attendees today. But what they do do is they, is they give us a useful kind of behind the curtain look at sample situations similar to ones that your institutions could find themselves in at some point. So I think what's worth highlighting here is the silver lining, is that all this high-profile litigation uh, has really shown the way for selected accommodations such as CART, American Sign Language, note-taking, and they have really become or are becoming the standard for most employers and for social media content and for any content that they're publishing elsewhere. Much like American universities, many employers, many American universities, American uh, employers have already realized that the social, socially responsible thing to do is to preemptively run an accessibility audit of your operations, <clears throat> establish you know, digital accessibility policies, 
set captioning quality guidelines that are in accordance with industry standards and continually improve their accessibility of company resources. That, of course, includes for the deaf and the hard of hearing and the blind. So, well, I, I, really, I, I, yeah, please go on. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me just jump in for one second. You just mentioned something that people. Uh, I think it's good advice for people. You mentioned an audit. Um, okay. l- l- let me put a plug into my colleagues across the country. My my employment lawyer colleagues. Um, that's a really helpful exercise. If you've never had it done in your business or your clients have never had it done, to have an employment attorney come in and conduct an HR audit to sit down and say, let's talk about your policies, your procedures. What do you do with hiring? How do you handle terminations? Do you have employee agreements? Um, you know, what do you do with discipline? I mean, it could be, you know, it's really a wide variety of topics, especially when it comes to wage and hour issues. Um, it usually takes a couple of hours. But, you know, if you're using a law firm now for those employers out there, um, ask, ask the employment attorney to come in and conduct an HR audit. I guarantee they will find something to improve on when it comes to the HR and the employment procedures, just because they're so quickly changing. Um, and some of these are so complicated. So that's a, that's a very helpful exercise. So that's, that's, the, that's the plug for my colleagues. Excellent. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the other thing I wanted to mention about the case studies briefly was that they, they are really fascinating, I think, and telling and different from the ones that we were talking about yesterday, aren't they? Uh, and, and they do expose that accessibility accommodations, especially in the context of employment, really don't offer a one-size-fits-all solution. So oftentimes, employers themselves, they don't know exactly what they need, and they're looking for experience-based guidance. So <clears throat> that really does bring me to this next slide, uh, which is nearly our final slide, and it's about choosing your agency if you do decide to use one, meaning using an agency if you, if you um, decide to go that route. So throughout the presentation, I've outlined the most popular accommodations relevant for the deaf, the hard of hearing, and the visually impaired communities. And I'm not trying to make this a sales pitch, but I do want to bring it to your attention that Carish provides all of these uh, services to corporations and law firms like yours, uh, to government institutions and to universities throughout, <clears throat> throughout the country every day, and we have for decades. So remember, please, that when it comes to ADA compliance accommodations, don't wing it. Uh, just reach out to us for advice and, and for guidance. There is no need to be apprehensive about your interactions that require accommodations if you are prepared. So uh, with the right advice and support, adding accommodations like card captioning and note-taking will be a great improvement, actually, to your, to your entire organization. So uh, a couple final notes before we go into the, the Q&A section is that uh, typically at this point in the presentation, I would, I would like to you know, walk through even more uh, practical considerations uh, that, that you might want to remember while you're implementing, implementing accommodations on-site or remote, things like setup and testing, or tech support, or security issues, uh, encryption, etc. cetera. But um, I've decided for this presentation to, to skip that uh, and because not everybody really needs it uh, to get into the nuts and bolts of that. But if you do, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to set up a demo for you free of charge for you and your tech team, if you have one, uh, or your admin team, and walk you through specific accommodations and how they would work uh, remotely. So uh, please uh, just contact us in the chat box or in the next slide, you'll see our contact details. I think you can move on to that one, Mike. All right, yeah, there you go. So you can contact us that way, um, and uh, we, we'd love to we'd love to clarify anything or walk through your specific situation. So it's time for it's time for questions. Uh, I guess we had we did we have had one already. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we had one in the chat in the chat box. By the way, just before I forget, I, I did put in the verification code for those attorneys out there. I just put it in the chat box. The information on um, on uh, how you get the uh, the credit, um, but don't sign off yet. The questions could be good. So, um, all right. So we had a question about uh, 
Oops, sorry about that. There we go. We had a question about um, uh, people self-identifying, employees self-identifying a disability. And, yeah. and, and people don't generally volunteer that information, whether they have a disability or not. That's correct. They don't. Um, so a couple, of, a couple of answers to that, to that question. First one is yeah. that under the ADA, the employer is not responsible to be proactive and approach the employee if they know or believe the employee has a disability. So if, uh, let's say, again, just trying to make this simple, you know, you have an employee, Sally, and Sally, you know, she limps. She has a noticeable limp. And it's not affecting her job, but you just notice that she has, uh, you know, she doesn't, doesn't, just doesn't walk, um, doesn't walk normally. Um, the employer has no responsibility to go to Sally and say, Sally, I couldn't help notice that, you know, you do have a, a noticeable limp or is there something we can do to make your job easier. You do not have to do that. It's the employee's responsibility to say, I'm having trouble performing my job. I would like an accommodation. Let's discuss. So that's the first thing. Many employers decide to be proactive and to do it, but you're not legally obligated to, to do that. Second thing is employees are not required to use any magic language to request an accommodation. They don't have to come to you and say, you know, I hereby request an accommodation under the ADA. Um, all they have to do really is say, I think I need a chair or I think I need some extra time off, or I may need to work from home in the morning because of a condition. That's considered a request for an accommodation. And the last part is the question is about self-identifying to keep records for federal contractors. Um, I have to say, I, I'm not familiar with that, that the federal contracting requirements um, the affirmative action programs and, and some of you who deal with federal contracts under FAR, F-A-R, um, require affirmative action plans, but don't generally require keeping statistics on disabilities. So if, if there is some sort of government contract that requires to keep uh, records of, of employees with disabilities, uh, to my experience, that would be pretty unusual. You could ask, just like you ask employees to self-identify their gender and their national origin uh, for affirmative action purposes, for those of you with government contracts, you could ask at the same time if they have a disability. But actually asking someone whether they have a health condition or a disability is contrary to the ADA regs. So that, that, that's an interesting issue. Um, you know, and and uh, and what I'm seeing in the chat is, you know, the workforce has to be a certain percentage. So that could very well be. So I would say that if they require that and they're not volunteering, then ask at the same time you're getting the other information in the in the beginning. So and I, and I know some and not to go on too long, but I know some state requirements uh, provide funding only if the workforce is of a certain percentage of, um, of disabled individuals. We have one client that only gets grants if they have over 50% of their workforce is disabled. I mean, that's difficult, right? To, to, main, to maintain that, so. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and, I see, and I see here in the, in the chat that it's a federal requirement from OFCCP, which is the Office of, um, of, uh, of, of, of contract uh, policies, I forget, OFCCP. Yeah, they, they, they regulate the affirmative action. So thank you for that. That's great, good to know. We also had a question here about the PowerPoint. So after uh, the question was, will the PowerPoint be available as an attachment to print out along with the recording? We typically don't send out the PowerPoint, uh, but, but of course we can. So uh, when, we, when we send you the recording, if, if, uh, if Shelly, if we don't remember to send you the additional attachment, then please just send us a reminder and we'll, we'll send it over to you. There, there's, a, there's a question as, you know, would it be a good idea if we reached out to HR and the union and asked them if they're ADA knowledgeable? Um, I think yes. And the answer is yes. Uh, you know, let's, the, the people in the company, in your or, or organization, your school, whatever it might be, 
there are some people that are responsible to handle ADA issues. You know, presumably that's human resources. Um, and it's not just ADA, right? It could be family medical leave. It could be workers comp. It could be just administering the policies. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, those, those people should know about the ADA and they should have guidance about what to do if there is a reasonable accommodation request. So that's where an HR audit would help. And that's where uh, training, you know, the same attorney that might come in and pr- provide an HR audit, you know, that same attorney, she could give training to your HR people about what to do or answer questions. Sometimes it's helpful just to get on a conference and to answer random questions from your HR folks um, uh, about that. Uh, when it comes to reaching out to your union, that, that's a more complicated issue, uh, whether it's a good idea to do that. We, we'd have to know a little bit more about what the issue is and your relationship with the union. That could, that could be a very good thing or that could backfire. <laughs> so. Okay, well, we're coming up to the end of our Q&A session. So we, of course, welcome any more questions that you have. If for whatever reason we don't, uh, we don't catch that question before we, uh, before we depart here, uh, then please just send us an email and I'll make sure that we answer it as promptly as possible. Uh, we will also be sending you a quick survey shortly after, after we terminate here. Uh, we'd ask you to just take a minute and share your thoughts and help us improve our content for future audiences. That would be really helpful. And please uh, support us uh, in generating more valuable content by liking and sharing our social media posts. That'd be really welcome as well. And, and come back next time. Follow our blog for, uh, for the next webinars coming up. And uh, please register and then bring a friend. Huh? Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. See you all next time.